Welcome to the Grind It Podcast. You know, life can be such a grind at times, and so we're here sharing God's Word with you to encourage you to keep grinding and to not give up. It's time to grind. So here's the host of the Grind It Podcast, the old school skateboarder himself, Randall Tucker. Welcome to the Grind It Podcast. Today we're going to pick up where we left off in Matthew chapter 9. Uh, Jesus has healed a paralyzed man by telling him that his sins were forgiven. And the religious leaders who had witnessed this, they were thinking to themselves, they didn't say it out loud, they were thinking in their minds, they were thinking, this is blasphemy because only God can forgive sins. So to prove that Jesus is God in the flesh, that he is the Messiah, that he has the authority to forgive sins, Jesus tells the man to get up and pick up his mat and go home. And it, that's exactly what happened. And immediately, in a blink of an eye, this this man jumps up, grabs his mat, and takes off. And, and so this paralyzed, this weak, real fragile man, his body just instantly became normal. And it had strength. All the ligaments and the tendons and the muscles, they all worked like they should have. And so there was no doubt as to what just took place. And the disciples who were also witnessing this event would know for certain that Jesus is God or the Son of God because they had just heard in Gadarene from the... uh, the, um, the demons that were cast out of those two men that lived in the graveyard, that Jesus is the Son of God. And so um, after that happens, uh, Jesus meets this man uh, who is a tax collector named Matthew, who is the author of this book that we're studying, by the way. And Matthew was chosen to be one of Jesus's disciples one of the 12 and so matthew decides that he wants to throw a big dinner so a lot of his tax collector friends could also meet jesus and hopefully their lives would be changed as well like his life has been changed and and so the religious leaders uh they get wind of jesus eating with all these tax collectors at matthew's house and their attitude is who eats with such scum And so what they're doing is they're investigating Jesus. And they're going to do this for the next three years. They're going to investigate Jesus. They're going to keep their eyes on Jesus so that they can just try to uh, come up with something, some little nugget that will just disprove him that he is not God, that he is a blasphemer like they're accusing him of being, and that this man, uh, he, he needs to die. And so what Jesus does, he exposes the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the the Sadducees, he exposes their true hearts. And so they're going to make it their mission for the next three years to get rid of this homeless wanderer who claims to be the Messiah. And they'll eventually get their way as they have him um, crucified on the cross. But Jesus, he has gone around and he's handpicked some disciples and, and he's going to continue to pick disciples until he has the 12 that he wants that's going to be following him for the next three, three and a half years. And these guys are going to be taking his place minus Judas Iscariot because he's going to hang himself after he betrays Jesus and sells him out for 30 pieces of silver. Um, but uh, then Matthias takes his place in Acts chapter 1. And so these 12 men are going to... Uh, take Jesus' place after he leaves earth and after he ascends back to heaven and sits at the Father's right hand. And the Holy Spirit comes down uh, and, and, and fills uh, these 12 men and, and God living on the inside of them, Jesus living on the inside of them through the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and but they're not aware of this yet. Uh, they're, they're, they have a different expectation of who the Messiah is or what exactly the Messiah will be doing, because they're thinking earthly kingdom. They're thinking we're going to rule and reign on this earth, and we're going to kick these Romans' butts, and we're going to be delivered from this Roman oppression. But that's not what Jesus had in mind. Uh, There was a... um, Jesus had in mind a a heavenly kingdom. But there, there was a man who was dressed in camel's hair that ate locusts and wild honey out in the desert, 
at the beginning of the book of Matthew. And his job was to prepare the way for the Messiah. And this man even baptized Jesus in the Jordan River. And when he did that and they come up out of the water, he saw the Holy Spirit come down in the form of a dove and land on Jesus' shoulder, which signaled to him that Jesus is the one, that he is the Messiah, that he is, as John the baptizer proclaimed, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Now John the baptizer also heard a voice from God the Father himself come down from heaven at that baptism after the Holy Spirit lands on Jesus' shoulder that affirms Jesus as God's Son. Now, John the baptizer, just like Jesus, he had disciples or he had some followers. And In fact, later on, uh, as John's going to be in prison, he's going to begin to lose his disciples and many of them begin to follow Jesus. Jesus, um, because John's going to be beheaded in, in prison. Uh, and so they, they, they go follow Jesus. Um, and so with the changing of the guard, if you will, from John to Jesus, John's disciples, is, is, I think this is a natural thing, they're, they're going to have some questions for Jesus. And, and if you think about it, John at this time He's not going around working miracles or casting out demons. The only thing John is doing is preaching the message of the kingdom of God and baptizing people. That's it. And so John has done his job. He has fulfilled his duty that God has given him, and that was to prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. And and he has done that. And so Matthew writes about an occasion uh, that one of some, uh, some of John's disciples, that they, they come to Jesus with a question, and that question has to do with fasting, which is found in verses uh, chapter nine, verses fourteen through seventeen. It says, one day, the disciples of John the, ba- the Baptist or baptizer came to Jesus and asked him, "Why don't your disciples fast like we do, and the Pharisees do?" And Jesus replied, "Do wedding guests mourn while celebrating with the groom? Of course not." But someday the groom will be taken away from them, and they will fast. Besides, who would patch old clothing with new cloth? For the new patch would shrink and rip away from the old cloth, leaving even a bigger tear than before. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, for the old skins would burst from the pressure, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. New wine is stored in new wineskins so that both are preserved. And so... Kind of what's going on here is is the old comparison game. Um, the John's disciples are comparing themselves to Jesus' disciples. I mean, they're getting to see all this cool stuff, and they're getting to witness all this cool stuff. You know, people being healed and, and, and uh, demons being cast out and uh, getting to hear all this great teaching while they're just out there in the desert with, with this guy in camel's hair, and, and he's preaching about the the kingdom coming and they're he's baptizing people uh for the remission of sins and so they're kind of comparing in my opinion um to themselves to jesus's disciples and they're also are comparing jesus's disciples to the religious leaders because they said hey we're fasting and we fast a lot just like the religious leaders fast but your disciples they're not fasting and they're not fasting. If they are fasting, they're not fasting very much at all. What's up with that, Jesus? Can you can you explain this? We fast, so why why do your disciples not fast? And so it, it's almost that they're asking, since you are the Messiah, as John has told us, and we believe that you are, and since you are the standard of righteousness and holiness, then why are you not teaching your disciples to fast? as if fasting maybe was a standard of some kind of holiness or um, it makes them more righteous if you fast. That, because that's what the religious leaders thought it was. The religious leaders made a huge ordeal uh, about fasting and when they were fasting and how often they fasted. They, they, they made sure that they let everybody know when they were in a fast and they let everybody know how many times a week they fasted. Uh, this is recorded in Scripture. Uh, but notice that Jesus doesn't rebuke John's disciples, nor does he answer them harshly. 
And he never says that fasting is not important because he's going to tell them uh, that there's coming a day that his disciples will actually fast, but just not right now. Because there's, there's some things that are way more important going on than fasting. There, there's this bigger picture, if you will, and that picture is Jesus teaching his disciples about the real kingdom of God. That it's not an earthly kingdom as they're expecting. And Jesus knows what the disciples are thinking when he's talking about the kingdom. And so he's trying to explain to them that, hey, my kingdom is not of this world, like he told Pilate. And and he's trying to get these disciples to realize that it's not going to be an earthly kingdom. It's much it's it's much more greater than an earthly kingdom. His his power. He he didn't come here to beat up on the Romans and deliver the Jews from the Roman oppression. He came here to deliver us Jews and Gentiles from sin. And then he was going to have to die on a cross, be buried in a tomb for three days, and be resurrected. And he's going to send to the Father. Uh, 40 days after that and he's going to send down the holy spirit and god would dwell inside of man by the power of the holy spirit and so there was a far bigger picture than what john's disciples could understand and jesus is saying hey this is what's going on and and so they're going to be fasting at some point but for now it's not the most important thing but it'll take care of itself in the end so jesus uses something that john's disciples would be very familiar with and that for to to explain their to to give an answer to their question and and so he uses a jewish wedding he says uh uh uh, that the 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 bridegroom uh let me see how, how does he put that he says uh um why don't your disciples fast like we do the and the pharisees do do wedding guests mourn while celebrating with the groom? And, and, and so um, he's going to use this example of, of, of a wedding, a Jewish wedding. And, and so um, a Jewish wedding back then, especially in the biblical days, the Bible days, it was a bigger ordeal than it is in our culture today. I mean, people make big ordeals out of weddings here, but, you know, they spend a lot of money on it, and they'll plan it far out in the future most of the time, and 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 um, they'll have a a, um, a bachelor party uh, for the the men, and um, um, I forget what the party is called for the women, but both both will have uh, you know this one last get together with friends, and they'll go do something fun and together, and it's like their last time to be single. And because they're about to have their wedding and, and they're going to be uh, coming together as one flesh. And so um, the Jewish culture, especially in the Bible times, when it came to a wedding, it was a much bigger ordeal than it is in, in our day and time, especially in the United States. Because a lot of people today, it's, it's no big deal. Uh, they just go down to the courthouse and, and get a marriage license and have the justice of the peace marry them. And, and, and you know, they say they're married because they are married uh, officially. Um, but back in biblical days, and you can go back and, and, and Google this and read about it. It's really not my point of this, of this passage. Um, just to say that it, it was just a bigger ordeal uh, than what it is in the United States and in our day and time. Um but you can go back and read that uh, and study that on your own. It's very interesting. But these these wedding uh, feasts, they would sometimes last up to two weeks, maybe even longer uh, than that. Um, but Jesus asks uh, John's disciples, he says, Do wedding guests mourn while celebrating with the groom? And then he's going to answer his own question. And maybe as, as he's asking them that question, they're, maybe they're, they're shaking their heads no. Uh, and so Jesus continues as he answers his own question. He says, of course not, but someday the groom will be taken away from them and they will fast. And we know that he's, he's, he is, uh, uh, we know what he means because we, we have the complete word of God. They're living the word of God. They're, they're living, uh, John's disciples are living it at that moment as they're having this discussion with Jesus. 
But we have the, the completed Word of God, so we can turn to a page in this book, in this Bible, and read this story and, and know the beginning from the end, or the end from the beginning. And we know what's going on at the beginning, we know what happens at the end, and we know what goes on in between. But at the time, they're asking Jesus this question, they have no idea what he's talking about. But we do. We know that he is talking about uh, the death, burial, and the resurrection of the Messiah himself. He knows that he's going to die in about three years. They don't know that, and they certainly don't understand that. But he does, and he, he says, but someday the groom will be taken away from them, and, and then they'll fast. So right now, the groom is with the disciples. There's no need to fast. The kingdom is here. The Messiah is here. The greatest thing that's ever walked on this planet is here. And so fasting is kind of, it's kind of not, not that big of a deal right now. The bigger picture is I'm here and I've got to teach these guys God's ways and how to be righteous because they're going to be taking over from me one day uh, in, in the far near future. And, and it's interesting that Jesus used, used this example about the wedding because he says someday the groom will be taken away from them and, and they will fast. Well, the church is known as the bride of Christ. Jesus is known as the groom. And there's, there's uh, even parables that Jesus uses about the groom and, and, and the bride. And, and, and you find this uh, in, in the book of Revelation as well. But... Also, at a Jewish wedding, um, there, there's alcohol, and a lot of alcohol. There's a lot of wine. Uh, that, that's just what uh, went on in their culture. And if you read about Jesus' first miracle uh, in John chapter 2, when he turned the water into wine, he is actually at a Jewish wedding feast. And they were drinking. They're having a good time. And they run out of alcohol. They run out of wine, alcoholic wine. And if you get the context of that passage... They are getting drunk. They're getting, uh, they're, they're partying. They're having a good time. I'll just leave it at that. Um, and so um, they run out of alcohol. They run out of wine. And they ask Jesus, or his mom does, hey, they're out of wine. And this is going to you know, embarrass these, these, uh, these guests and th these people who put on this party. So make some more wine for these people. Um, and I'm not even going to pretend that I know anything about making wine or moonshine or, you know, wine shine or any kind of alcohol. But Jesus said um, that when you make new wine, this is what he tells the uh, John's disciples. He says, when you make new wine, you don't use old bottles that, that are made of old wine skins because in the process of fermenting, they'll burst, they'll explode, and you're going to lose your wine. You don't want that to happen. You want to be able to drink that wine. You don't want to put all that work into it for nothing. Um, and so he says you have to put new wine in new wine skins so that during the ferment, uh, fermentation process they won't burst and you can have a drink later on uh, that uh, after that process is over with because during that fermentation process what happens is and I'm, I'm not an expert on this I've never done this before like I just said but but what happens is during that fermentation process the bottle stretches and and if, if you if you put new wine into an old bottle made of old wine skins it's already been stretched from the first fermentation process what if it, it, it if it has to go through another fermentation process it's not going to hold up it's just going to give away it's going to explode because it's already been stretched to its limits and it goes beyond its limits and it explodes it pops it's kind of like uh, if you've ever dropped a, a, a two liter coke bottle uh, or a soda and uh and then all that carbonation gets stirred up in there and all of a sudden that bottle begins to swell up and 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 i've seen this happen sometimes where it, it just got so big that the lid explodes or the bottle uh pops off and so this is basically what what jesus is saying is going to happen if you put new wine skin in old bottle i mean if you put new wine into old bottles and these made of these old wine skins it's going to pop like that 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 carbonated drink inside that two liter um, and so he, he says you put new wine in new wine skins because during that fermentation process that that new wine skin hasn't been stretched yet and so it'll stretch as the fermentation uh, process takes place and the pressure comes along it'll just stretch along and, and it won't burst it'll just stretch and not give way and and he also uses uh, 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 for an example a patch on a garment he says you wouldn't use a patch made from new clothing 
because it hasn't been stretched yet. And if you do, it's gonna it's it's gonna stretch at some point. And it, and that rip that you just patched with that new uh, patch, it's gonna just rip even bigger. Uh, the tear is gonna be much larger. And so he says you use old cloth to make a patch for old clothing. Why? Because that old cloth has already been stretched. And the clothing that you're putting it on to cover up that, that rip, it's stretched. And so therefore, once you sew that onto your, uh, on your clothing and cover up that rip, it's going to be stretched already and it'll, it'll stay stretched. And it'll, it, it won't shrink and it'll, everything will it'll be just fine. It'll work as the patch as it should. And so the whole idea here that Jesus is talking about with these wineskins and with these, this patch for clothing is preservation. It's preservation. Jesus is saying, um, what Jesus is saying here is, 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 is what you all know is old, uh, talking to his disciples. He says, it, it's an old covenant. And I'm here to establish a new covenant between God and man. What you all know, th this is the old way. That's why in the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you have heard it said, but now I say to you. Yes, I, and he's basically saying, hey, look, I gave Moses the law. I'm God. That law came from God. I was with God. So I, I basically gave the law to Moses. And I'm greater than the law. I'm, I'm greater than Moses. And this is an issue that they, the, the people had with Jesus, especially the religious leaders. They, they just thought he was a blasphemer. And they saw him as a homeless man, a nomad who had no place to lay his head. And he was just an ordinary dude. He didn't fit their expectation. And it just blew their mind. But Jesus says, look, this is the old way. I'm here for a new way, a new covenant between God and man. It's no longer about circumcision of the flesh. It's about circumcision of the heart. And that's what Paul says in Colossians chapter 2 down around verse 10. He talks about how we're baptized into Christ. When we're baptized into Christ and washed in the blood of Jesus, then we have a circumcision not made with hands, but a circumcision made of the heart. It's a spiritual circumcision. Uh, and so Jesus is saying here, I'm here to preserve this away. I'm not here to do away with it, but to preserve it. It's no longer about following rules and regulations and circumcision of the skin. And he's, he, he's, he's saying here that I'm about to shed my blood, uh, and, and my blood is far greater than all the animals that's ever been sacrificed combined. He says, I'm not here to do away with the old system, but to preserve it, to establish a new system, a system of grace and mercy and love and compassion. And if you go back to Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20, and I, don't, I don't usually use the message version very much because sometimes it's far out there on its translation. But I want to read uh, Matthew 5, 17 through 20 from the message. It says, don't, G, this is Jesus talking. He says, don't suppose for a minute that I have come to demolish the scriptures. <clears throat> Most versions say abolish. <coughs> Excuse me. Abolish means do away with. But I like the way the, the, uh, the message says it. Don't, don't suppose for a minute that I have come to demolish the scriptures, either God's law or the prophets. I'm not here to demolish, but to complete. I'm going to put it all together, pull it all together in a vast panorama. God's law is more real and lasting than the stars in the sky and the ground at your feet. Long after the stars burn out <clears throat> and earth wears out, God's law will be alive and working. Trivialize even the smallest item in God's law and you will only have trivialized yourself. But take it seriously. Show the way for others and you will find honor in the kingdom. Unless you do far better than the Pharisees in the matters of right living, you won't know the first thing about entering the kingdom of heaven so jesus is saying to john's disciples here he's saying my disciples and this is my translation here my disciples are doing what i need them to do don't worry about these small details that seem huge to you because in due time it's going to work itself out and they're going to be fasting and they're going to be fasting a lot quite often but i want to end the podcast with this final thought and this goes for all of us, including myself. I know a lot about the Bible, but I, there's a whole lot that I don't know. And what I have to remember is there's a lot of people that know a lot more than me, 
about the Bible. They've studied it for a lot longer and a lot deeper. But there's also a lot of people out there who don't know very much about the Bible. They don't know as much as I do. They don't know as much as you do. And that's great that you study and that you are learning and you're listening to these podcasts, including my podcast, the, the Grounded Podcast, and, and you're and you're uh, growing closer and closer to Jesus and you're learning more about Jesus and you're learning more about the righteousness of God and how He expects us to live. That's great. But just keep in mind that not everybody is on the same level when it comes to spiritual knowledge, when it comes to biblical knowledge, when it comes to knowing God's word. That's why Paul is talking to the church at Corinth and and he says, look, some of y'all are still babies. You should have been mature by now, but you're still babies and you're drinking milk. When you, you should be eating solid foods, talking about, you know, I, he says, I've got to go back and rehash all these basic principles to you. He said, well, we should be able to move on from these things and, and, and you your, your learning could be more mature. And so I just want to say this, be patient. Jesus was patient with John's disciples here. He was never harsh to them. He didn't answer them in a harsh way. He answered them in an understanding and loving, caring way. And he got his point across. So be patient with others who do not have as much biblical knowledge as you do. And encourage them to keep studying and to keep on learning to be more like Jesus every day. Thank you for listening today. Thank you for sharing the Grounded Podcast with your friends and family and coworkers, anybody that you come in contact with. Because when you share the Grounded Podcast, you are, you are also sharing Jesus. God bless you. Keep grinding. Thank you for listening to the Grounded Podcast today. May God bless you. If you have any comments or questions, you can email them to us at thegrinditpodcast at gmail.com. If you would like Randy to come and speak at your church or your next event, you can contact him through that same email address. Also, I would like to thank Jody Foster's Army, also known as JFA, for their song, Abba, as we use for our intro and our outro, off their untitled 1984 album. May God bless you, and remember, keep your eyes on Jesus and keep grinding.